about to watch an investigation probing the unique qualities that mark those who disturb, challenge, and lead. It is the search for the originals. These specially commissioned television portraits are presented by Moses Sniper. Jaron Lanier is credited with inventing or creating virtual reality, but he believes any of us might have. What I'd really like to see is not the 500 channel universe, but the universe where there are as many channels as there are viewers. Um, there's absolutely no reason that every child can't be their own television station in the future, and in fact much, much more than that. I mean, that's, uh, we're starting to see a little bit of that happening with the World Wide Web, and when you see how people rise to the occasion when they're given the chance, it's extraordinary. People are inherently creative, and when you frustrate their ability to be creative, especially when you do it in their childhood, I think you create sickness. Cyberspace was invented in Vancouver by science fiction writer William Gibson. Other fashionable terms we hear these days, the net, the web, the information highway, are all aspects of cyberspace. According to John Perry Barlow, rock lyricist and computer activist, we're in cyberspace when we talk on the telephone because the person we're talking to is in the room. That is what we experience, and that feeling is how we know we're in cyberspace, when the psychic and the physical reality are not one and the same. The importance of Jaron Lanier is that he has created a virtual reality machine in which we are unfettered by any actual physical limitations. The perfect triangle, the perfect square do not exist in nature, but in our minds, in our power to conceive a more perfect reality capable of illuminating the rest of our existence. That's what Jaron Lanier thinks his machine and others yet to be created can accomplish. They can release our imagination into a world we've not seen or experienced since childhood. Eternally, I believe anyway, um, a profoundly fluid sense of imagination, a profoundly empowered imagination in which the world is different every day. Of course, they're the center of that world. Now, there's a certain age at which children discover something that has to be described as a great indignity, as a great insult to them, which is that the only world in which they can meet their parents the only world in which they're not entirely alone, the only world in which there's food and sustenance, is this world called the physical world. And in the physical world, they are a helpless little, weak, pink, pudgy thing. This is, it's embarrassing, it's, it's an awful piece of news. And uh, kids can't accept it at first. And uh, they find themselves in really a lifelong conflict between the internal world of the imagination, which is infinite, but completely isolated, solipsistic, and the shared world of sustenance and companionship, which is pretty dull by comparison. Um, now, the reason kids instinctively like virtual reality so much is because they can tell that virtual reality, for the first time, might bridge this gap. And this is the amazing thing. Virtual reality is objective like the physical world, but potentially, if we can solve the programming problem, flexible like a daydream. And that's unprecedented. Now, I'll give you an example. I'm going to make up a sentence. I'm going to say that the audience watching this right now are all transformed into crystalline seahorses. And we're all going to dance the samba on a great 
turquoise plate orbiting Saturn. Now, the effort it took me to compose that sentence was minimal, and yet to actually realize that experience as an experience would cost trillions and trillions of dollars. It would involve accelerating the space program to get us out to Saturn, creating all the genetic manipulation tools to turn us into the crystalline seahorses, and then we'd also have to pay for the Samba lessons, right? <laughs> so there's a lot of money there, and I just saved it just by wiggling my tongue around. And you see, that's what a child learns when they're little, that there's one little tiny part of their body that they can control as fast as they think and feel, and it's their tongue and then their hands. And we've learned to use these little tiny parts of the universe that we can actually control in real time to refer to all of the possibilities that we don't have the power to create, and that's the birth of language. But in virtual reality, there's an alternate path of actually creating those things. In a world that's controlled by a program, and so you're in a world that's fundamentally less mysterious than the physical world, and in that sense, you could say it's inferior. But the mystery comes up anyway. And the reason it comes up is because more than one person at a time can be in a virtual world. And so all of those people at once can contribute their own little ideas and surprising behavioral quirks and uh, their, their, their own little you know, creative tweaks to the world. And the intersection of all of those human ideas and energies um, creates a new kind of mystery. It creates a new sort of nat nature. Um, and uh, one of the interesting questions to ask about virtual reality is how do you recognize somebody in the virtual world? Because the virtual world is essentially made entirely of disguise. And so um, a person's body music comes through, their characteristic poetry of motion, um, and their style of creativity comes through. And, um, now of course, if they're talking, their, their, their voice might come through as well. But let's leave out the voice for a second. So excluding the voice, the thing that really distinguishes one person from another is the characteristic of a wave of creative change that you just see happening in the virtual world. The way in which virtual reality can become something truly worthwhile is if it's coupled with advances in making programming much, much easier. If programming becomes much, much easier, first of all, it will happen within the virtual world. So while you're inside virtual reality, you'll be able to reprogram it. Now, what I want to see is a type of programming that's entirely different than what we're used to right now. I don't want to see somebody inside a virtual world calling up a virtual computer and typing. I think that would be absurd. I look at human beings and I ask myself, what are human beings really good at doing? And human beings are good at combining the mind and the body together. We are at our best. For instance, I can improvise understanding. I mean, it's just something, it's an ingrained pattern that involves my mind and my body. I want programming to be like that. I want to be able to pick up things that are like musical instruments in the virtual world and be able to practice over the years and develop a sense of virtuosity in them and be able to improvise the content of the virtual world so fast that it's at conversational speed. The idea is to be able to make up the content of the virtual world with the same speed that I could form sentences now. See, that's the key. And if, if, if a generation of kids grew up being able to play these programming instruments in the virtual world so that they could conversationally create the content of the world with each other as a form of dream conversation, reality conversation, ah, that's where it gets wonderful. Then we have a major new adventure, a new type of communication. Um, and that, that is very significant. That would never, <laughs> in fact, I think that would be the most spectacular adventure imaginable. traditional place for this and um, you know um, Apple and Hewlett Packard and so many other places started in garages in Palo Alto so sort of the thing you do so uh, we had our garage and I was making some video games freelance and uh, had enough money from that to hire a few friends to work with me on these programming language projects and uh, we were just kind of doing it unofficially and then it became quite a big deal now there were a few key new ideas that happened in, in that lab that hadn't happened before. One was the idea of putting the human body into the interface. So 
um, instead of um, just manipulating an interface that you saw out there, we put a glove on your hand so your ha you could see your hand inside the virtual space and you could pick up imaginary things as if they were real. And that was something very new and different. Um, computers have tended to celebrate only the intellect and make the body fall asleep. And our idea was completely different. We're saying, let's use the wisdom of the body. Let's imagine a form of computing that's highly physical. Um, and then another idea happened, which was key, which is the realization that you could have more than one person in a simulated space. Now, I remember this very well, because this was so spectacular. When we first got the glove working so you could pick up imaginary things, that was intensely exciting. And then uh, we got the first um, color virtual world ever to happen, and that was very exciting. And then we networked two people together for the first time so that you could, each could look at the other. And that was incredible. You know, when you look at another person inside virtual reality, they have an extraordinary presence, even though the body can't be their original body. It's some virtual um, puppet, essentially, that they made up. But the motion carries the subtle communicative body music of that person, and so the presence is extraordinary, combined with their voice. And um, that experience of having a new objective place was uh, completely amazing. Whenever you work with computers, you have to be working with the programs that were written to make those computers function. And you can't create a computer program without having ideas built into that program. So what that means is that if you play music on a computer, you're working with human ideas that were set down in that computer. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. But let's contrast it for a second with the situation when you're playing an acoustic musical instrument, like a clarinet or something. Now, a clarinet is a piece of the physical world. It's made of that mysterious stuff that comprises our physical world. And when I say that mysterious stuff, I mean that very precisely and uh, very intensely. Uh, the, the discipline of scientists is to understand that no matter how much we want to believe in our abilities or our wisdom, the truth is that all of our theories about nature are subject to being overturned at some future date. Science is always provisional. We live in the center of a sea of profound mystery, and we just tentatively explore it, but we never completely conquer it. So um, when you're interacting with this clarinet, the level of subtlety in it, the level of mystery in it, is completely infinite. And you can play a clarinet for, for decades and continue to discover new things, continue to become a better player in ways that are even beyond your understanding. Um, when you work with computers, since you're working with an instrument that was built out of human ideas in the, in the computer's program, really ultimately, your, uh, the expression we use sometimes is drinking your own whiskey. <laughs> Instead of contacting that fundamental mysteriousness, you're ultimately um, elaborating on seeds that are not mysterious at all. Now, the elaboration of See, of human ideas can be very wonderful, but it can never, I think, match the fundamental confrontation of mystery that happens when we confront the physical world, whether it's in science or in learning to play instruments. The act of improvising music with other musicians is one of the closest experiences, I think, that we can have towards really bridging the gap that exists between people just because of the way we happen to exist biologically in separate bodies. Um, on a very personal note, my, my mother was a musician, and I think there's some sort of very deep bond with her. She died when I was a kid. So there's a, there's a very personal connection. Um, and I think there's another thing about music, which is that I love it because it engages so many people so profoundly, and it doesn't accomplish anything constructive. And I'm a very um, enthusiastic believer in uh, and doing things just for love, and music is a great example of that. Of course, all the arts are. Uh, I think if we can't learn to do that better, we won't survive. One of the things about being a musical performer is you have to, in a sense, hmm, how do I say this? You have to learn to appreciate yourself very much as a part of nature instead of separate from it. And what I mean by that is that your body is able to do things in playing music that are far beyond your mind's capacity to understand. 
or at least the part of the mind that thinks intellectually. And so the mind part of you has to appraise the body part of you as just this phenomenon that you're, you can't exactly manipulate it, but you can try to learn to dance with it or sort of surf with it or something like that. So it's a, it's a very interesting experience that way. And so in that sense, I think, for instance, if you learn to play an instrument well, the way your mind watching your hands move on that instrument, it's a little bit like watching ocean waves or clouds or some other natural phenomenon. It's ultimately beyond you. I would define a mystic as someone who finds a profound sense of joy in the necessary humility of trying to understand the universe. And of humility with profound joy, I think, is the core of mysticism. Um, somebody who's disturbed by the limitations in our ability to know is not a mystic. Somebody who goes into denial and pretends to be able to know what they can't is a positivist or a materialist. Um, I think it's entirely appropriate to be both mystical and scientific, and it certainly is appropriate to be mystical and musical. intellectual Jewish parents. My mother was a Holocaust survivor. I uh, grew up in southern New Mexico in the deserts. My mother died when I was little. Uh, very awkward childhood in that cultural surrounding. Um, very difficult. Uh, my dad and I built a wild um, mm, uh, a uh, a wild home to live in, starting in tents, and took us seven years. And a home made of crystals and spires and domes and things. Uh, part of which is no longer standing. It was uh, not particularly well engineered, but it was uh, wonderfully eccentric. Um, I, uh, my well, because um, because of my mom's death, I went through very very difficult adolescence and uh, uh, had to struggle quite hard to regain a footing in this world. Um, it was a struggle, and uh, I uh, became involved in mathematics pretty young, entered college young, and uh, had many eccentric experiences there while I was a pretty young uh, student in uh, graduate school there. I. Uh, was working as an assistant midwife and taking care of indigent babies, and <laughs> I had a uh, goat herd. I uh, made a living uh, selling goat milk and cheese. There's been such a celebration of the outsider in popular media now, really since the 60s, that it's become the mainstream. And so now the mainstream youth cult culture is to try to affect some sort of outsider pose. and. Um, um, now that's the sort of odd way that the consumerist culture sort of eats its own meaning constantly. It digests itself. And uh, uh, so it's almost to the point that the term outsider doesn't mean much anymore. Um, part of that is very good. I mean, that's a symptom also of a society beginning to accept diversity, which I hope is what's happening. Um, I don't think the outsider-insider dynamic is is quite so important, perhaps, as um, the development of, uh, of self-reliance. You know, I think there's a, um, what was important to me, I think, in my early development was being forced to, uh, to, to find a way to cope with my circumstances and, 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 and myself. And they happen to be unusual circumstances, but I don't, how was I to know they were unusual? The key question is a question of openness versus closedness in the future. It's a glasnost question. And the closedness question is going to come from different sources than usual. Um, you see, software has to be built up in layers. 
And once new layers are built over the old layers, the old layers kind of ossify. <laughs> and I, I, I call this the sedimentation process. And so, for instance, MS-DOS, the dopey little program that's the core of Microsoft's software world, is going to be with us for a thousand years because it's sedimented underneath all this other stuff. And we're stuck with it, even though it's already completely obsolete. Now, if you couple that realization with the realization that software really does have a point of view, that in the future we're not just going to be sending blocks of text around that could just as well have been published in magazines, but rather we're going to be sending hypertext and interactive illustrations and all these things that directly reflect the theories of the world built into the programs that made them. The combination of those two, is, two ideas is really quite scary. It means that we might be solidifying in place software that has a point of view that we'll never get rid of. So that means that right now, as we create this world information infrastructure, we are writing a constitution for the future of culture, from which there be, might be almost no appeal. <laughs> so for instance, the future of privacy is not a policy question, it's a technical question. The future of privacy will be determined by how the programs are written before they hit the sedimentation stage, period. Um, it's not just the future of privacy, it's the future of commerce, the future of democracy. So we're living in profoundly important times. I think in the future, this generation is not going to be remembered for anything but those programs. That's going to be the overwhelming factor that we leave behind. You know, in the future, computers might be running on quantum materials or proteins, and we might all be living in space colonies, and we might have a culture based on some sort of anarcho-communal sexuality or some. Who knows how things will change? But those programs, we're never going to get rid of them. <laughs> so we have to get it right now. And um, uh, it's scary. Jaron Lanier warns that his generation and those younger are writing a constitution for the future culture. What makes him unique is that he's not only defined virtual reality, but inhabits it and creates within it. It's as though Marshall McLuhan had said, the medium is the message to music and then danced it originally.